Good morning, Illinois. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. I have worked in public health for a long time. So I started when I was 18 doing CQI in hospitals and have worked in health departments. And, um, and even before that, when all my little high school or my little childhood friends, they would open lemonade stands, uh, I would actually go and inspect them and shut them down. So it's been a long career in public health uh, for me. And so what I really hope to do today is share some perspectives and think through some, some tools that can really help you achieve your goals. Uh, no matter how uh, handsome and smart my mother thinks I am, you're not going to remember necessarily what I said, but hopefully you're going to take away some of the tools that are out there. Uh, because that's the thing I find most interesting is that there's a lot of people making a lot of tools for public health practice. Uh, but we're like an ace hardware that doesn't advertise. And so the people who actually need those tools, y'all, uh, really don't always know that they're there. So it's really important that we have these times to share these tools. And so that's really the main crux of what I hope to do today. Um, and hopefully have a little fun while we do it. Uh, so this is me. Um, email address, Twitter, feel free to tweet anything. Um, I'm, I'll give a huge plug to Twitter. I, you know, Again, I spent 10 years in governmental public health. I was in the Philadelphia Department of Health. It was the Texas Department of State Health Services, the Georgia Department of Health. And um, I understand the limitations. I've had that meeting with the PIO who's like, well, health is everything, right? Yes, health is everything. So you can't really tweet about what you do at work, right? And so since health is everything, uh, you can't tweet about anything. It's like, well, no, actually, I, I do want to do this you know, engagement with people. So um, please try to feel free to tweet. and get on Twitter if you're not, because there's a lot of good information. That's where a lot of us are putting our tools. And so following places like De Beaumont and Asto and Nacho will help you find the tools and resources that we're putting out. So what we know is that really disease is different now, right? Bugs and bacteria isn't really what's killing us. Okay, when you look at the top 10 reasons that people uh, die, that we die, flu is the only bug that we have there. So this is about a very different kind of disease dynamic than we've had previously. And so we need to be thoughtful about how we approach that. And even though now most of our health care and our health issues are, are community driven, are social, are environmental, we kind of stay in this medical model. Now, I, I had to use this because I keep seeing this commercial. So I, I watch a lot of TV. Who's seen this commercial, right? Does it annoy you as much as it annoys me? And, and I mean, I love, I love Doogie Howser, and I watch Scrubs, and I grew up on ER. Uh, but there's this whole trope in this, in this commercial about, you know, just take control of your health. If you just take control, you'll be healthy. No, 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 wait. Um, because I, I can try to be healthy, and I can go to the doctor, and I can take my, my medicine, and I can do all these things, but if I have a, a community that is simply antagonistic to health, how is it that I'm supposed to stay healthy? So take this for example. Now, this is a slide from the Bronx in New York. Now on the, on the far side, you have the actual uh, percent of residents who rated conditions uh, of housing either fair or poor. And on the side closer to me, you have uh, asthma rates. You notice the overlay there? So wait a second. Wait, wait. These guys said, as long as I you know, go to my doctor and get my preventive care and get my annual health, I can be healthy. That undermines that, right? Because if, if the areas that have the worst housing have the highest rates of asthma, then what is it that I can do with a, with a provider that will actually make me healthy? Let's look at this. This, I always use this slide because my mother-in-law sent this to me. And she's like, is this what you do? And I'm like, if after 14 years of marriage, you finally understand what I do. Uh, and this is after saying things like, well, he's a doctor, like in medicine. I'm like, no, I'm not a doctor. I'm nothing like medicine. But she's finally said, well, this made it, this made it work for her. Um, so this is interesting because in Philadelphia, you had young women of color getting kidney stones. Now, kidney stones is typically something in, you know, middle-aged white dudes like me. So why is it that you would have this issue 
in these young, young girls of color. Now, interestingly, the folks at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia looked at this, and, and those physicians didn't actually, you know, they treated the immediate issue, but then they asked why. Why would this be happening? They could have just, you know, treat, go, treat, go, and you'd have that circle. But they actually tried, they took a second, they said, let's break this circle. And they started talking to the, to, talking to the girls and, and thinking about what's happening. And what was interesting, with, the girls weren't drinking water. And they weren't drinking water because in the school, the water was gross. The, 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 the water came out gray. The drinking fountains were disgusting. And so their water intake went way down. And they said, this might be a reason this is happening. And so they worked with the schools, they worked with the water department, they worked with partners to solve this problem. And that's really the most important thing. And if there's one thing to walk away from today remembering, it's that to solve this problem, there was not a pillar procedure. Is that these kids were only made better through partnerships. And this is where we are, right? Do you all feel this? Do you resonate with this? Okay, so we're trying to improve population health. And we have really dedicated providers. And they're doing innovative practices, and they're dedicated to their cause. But all they really have in this context is bigger and more buckets, right? So we're gonna expand the number of community health centers by 15% more bigger buckets. Health care is, is essential to keep this boat afloat while we're working on the whole, right? And that's the, that's the real important part, is that everybody that you're going to work with in a community has a role in filling that hole. And for, you know, educators, it's about having, having students ready to learn, having students who are healthy and can engage. For businesses, it's about having consumers that are healthy enough to work and then buy your product. It's about having employees who are healthy who can come to work. For hospitals, as we get into value-based care, it's about having communities where people can go and be healthy and recover and not end up back into the hospital. For economic development people, I mean, you know, we used to do for a long time, it was the tax credits, right? You're going to come work in, you're going to come locate your business in my state because we have all these tax credits. But at some point, the tax credits aren't enough to cover the costs of paying for diabetes and hypertension and the healthcare costs of your, your staff, or the productivity costs. So all of us have an opportunity to really impact health. And for public health, our public health 3.0 role here is that we can be the nexus that helps people understand their role in health. But understand it, and this is important, understand it through their lens, not our lens. And that's really important. Because, you know, in business, everybody talks about what's the WIFM, you know, what's in it for me. And public health often approaches things as kind of like, we just want to tell you about our cool stuff. So when you meet with that education person, you're not talking about your home visiting program or the things you're doing in your health department. You want to talk to them about how do we get your test scores up? How do we lower your, your, your dropout rate? How do we increase graduation? Because all of those things have a health component. And that's what we have to do a much better job you know, working with them, working with our partners to find ways to get to common goals together. And, and it's, not, it's not easy. Right? This is the Tower of Babel. This is like the degree to which my biblical scholarship goes. So go with me on this. Um, so when you think about the Tower of Babel, everybody was, was speaking and everything was wonderful. And then God, you know, struck down the tower and spread everybody out and everybody spoke different languages. Don't you ever kind of feel like we're the same way? You know, police and public health? Crime. Crime is a public health problem. Guns is a public health problem. I got into public health because to me, everything was a public health problem. But then when you go to someone else's table and you say, this is a public health problem, it becomes a turf war. And so we're not making the partnerships that we want. And what we really need to do, there is a, I want you to, to get ready. I'm going to give you a book, a book you have to read. 
It's a book on partnerships and strategies. Okay? And you just got to promise me. It was written, it was written by a doctor. Okay? It's Horton, here's a who. So I have a six and an eight-year-old. So I read a lot of Dr. Seuss. And some of you went, oh, it's not a leadership, it's not a strategy book, it's not a partnership book. Of course it is. It is the best partnership book there ever was. An even better partnership book for public health. Because let's be really clear. We're the who's. Okay? We're not Horton. We're on the spec. <laughs> We're crying out to people. We're here. Do not replicate us in healthcare. We actually are here. Stop hiring our people for more money. <laughs> We're here. So we, we need to really, you know, be that voice and talk to people about why, why there's value in public health. What's the health value to, to you, to you, the small business owner? Take this, for example. I love this story. Um, and Peter, this is why I can go long or not, because I just tell stories. And my son and I, every Friday night, watch Shark Tank together. I, I love Shark Tank. And he says to me, Daddy, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I pause for a second. His grandmother was a type 2 diabetic. His grandfather, I'm sorry, his great-grandmother was a type 2 diabetic. His grandfather's a type 2 diabetic. His father is a type 2 diabetic. There is some non-zero probability that he's going to be a type 2 diabetic. And I worry about him, not because he's not smart, he's wicked smart. Not because he wouldn't take risks. Trust me, every day he proves at 8 he is willing to take risks. Thoughtful risks and unthoughtful risks alike, but he will take the risks. Uh, the problem is I just worry about him having health insurance. I worry about him being chronically ill and not being able to afford care. And so how do you open your own business? I was watching something on Fox News uh, because I do watch all the stations. So I'm not a devotee of anyone. But there was a great thing about um, how to start your own business on Fox News. And they talked about what's an LLC and, you know, how to indemnify yourself. They never talked about how you'll ever take care of your health and your families. So you can make tons of money and then get wiped out like that because you don't have health care. So if you think about what made America great, entrepreneurialism, innovation, small business. Half this country has a chronic disease. Half the country's workforce can't do those things. I have a, a very good friend who is in uh, West Virginia, and he does woodworking. He does beautiful woodworking. He is making me a clock for my office as we speak. Uh, and he's had an aortic valve replacement. And uh, he has no health insurance. And I say, how's that working out for you? Uh, and he says, you know, I, this is what I do. I'm going to do this work. And I just hope this doesn't catch up and bite me in the ass. It will. We all know that. But this is a huge problem. And this is the way you frame these messages for the Hortons. Right? So don't think you're going to change everybody in your community. Don't think every partner is going to come and be like, oh, my God, I get it. You just came and told me this, and now I have this epiphany. Remember, in the excellent partnership book that Horton Hears a Who is, all the other animals in the jungle wanted to actually... You know, lock Horton up, they thought he'd gone mad. Because he heard the spec and, and actually no one else could hear him. No one else could hear the people on the spec. It took Horton working with the people on the spec, the Who's, to actually convince everybody else that there was something of value there. And so it's really vital that we find our Hortons in health. And that's going to be your hospital CEOs, that's going to be your chambers of commerce. They are out there. And they may not agree with everything that we're trying to do, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but we have to find our commonalities. So some of the tools that we've developed at DeBeaumont to help with partnership, one is this Practical Playbook. So the Practical Playbook is a website. It's also a book. We have a second book coming out in January that really tries to identify partnerships and present lessons learned. We have a whole slate on the website of different case studies so www.practicalplaybook.org, worth checking out. This is really fun. Um, I, I really highly recommend this article by Gene Matthews. Gene was um, the lead counsel at CDC for like, I think it was like 150 years. Um, 
and now he's at UNC. Gene is a friend. I like Gene. And this really talks about this whole kind of crafting richer stories talks about not how you just talk to people who agree with you, but talk to people who don't. You know, the more conservative, the more libertarian values. How do you address them? I, I often think if, if, if I had a choice, you know, to spend four hours with Elizabeth Warren or 15 minutes with Trump, I would pick the 15 minutes with Trump. Because Elizabeth Warren agrees with me. Like, I know she does, right? She agrees with you. We're probably actually too conservative for Elizabeth Warren and what we're doing with health. She wants to push, right? We spend a whole lot of time, we are very good in public health speaking to the choir. We are great pastors in our own church. We need to do more missions. So do I think I'm gonna change Donald Trump's minds in 15 minutes? No, but I'm gonna start. I'm gonna to try to convert him. I'm gonna to try to ask him like, you know, hey, for your golf club down in Mar-a-Lago, you have a lot of people who work in that golf club who are minimum wage and you know what the, the closest place that they can find housing is about two hours away at some point they're going to find jobs where they live and they're not going to be able to work for your golf club and that's going to be the, your, the, the, the golf course and that's going to be a problem for you so you have a benefit you have a vested interest in really helping me think through the health of your community where your business is and maybe that'll help but this really talks through how do you craft these messages now this is the cool thing I also want to put a plug in for the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. So a lot of us got our graduate training, we got MPHs, and we you know, look at the evidence, right? Do you remember this? Do you get the evidence, look in the literature. And then you get to the health department, and you realize you had no access to the literature. It's like, well, I'm going to go get this from the library. And someone told you, like, hey, there's no library here. <laughs> and you're like, oh, thank you, grizzled public health veteran. Like, we've all had that experience, right? And so Journal of Public Health Management Practice is putting tons and tons and tons and tons of stuff free and open access in their journal. And this is the journal that I think most of you would find the articles that resonate with your practice. This is a journal of public health practice. And so I encourage you to check out the journal when you have time. Uh, I think it is hugely, hugely important. And then there's Build Health Challenge, Build is an acronym for Bold, Upstream, Integrated, Local, and Data-Driven. This is a report that just came out. Uh, we talked to these hospital executives who came into this build project with us. They had to match our grant of $250,000. We asked them, why'd you do it? Because we know there are a whole lot of hospital systems that say, ooh, the ER kind of keeps me open. I need that revenue. Right? That's the only reason you have these billboards in some states that say like two minutes to the ER wait, right? Have you seen these? Which don't make a lot of sense because if I'm, you know, have like a gunshot wound, I'm not gonna say, oh, go to this one that's a little further away, they have a shorter wait. Right? That's the evolution of ER to primary care, and that's why you have a wait time there. So we know that there are those folks. We know there are folks who think the NICU is a great source of revenue, but there are other really thoughtful hospital CEOs who are on the crest of the wave. Folks who said to us in this report that our community is not a pipeline of patients for the healthcare system. Hospital CEOs who said, I really hope to never, ever meet every person who lives in my community. That's not what healthcare is for. And this report lays out some of their strategies for how we can better integrate with healthcare. It's a worthwhile read. And then there is this project, and this is one of the reasons to follow to Beaumont on Twitter and check out our website. We are working on this project called Phrases, Public Health Reaching Across Sectors. Now, let's be really clear. DC and Atlanta drop a whole lot of stuff on the public health workforce in the nation and don't give you all a lot of guidance. Public Health 3.0, Chief Health Strategist, um, Social Determinants of Health. These are all great buzzwords. These are all great destinations but we don't have any training for it. We don't have any funding streams to get there. So how do we form multi-sector partnerships? We said that whoever is just saying it, we need multi-sector partnerships. Oh, I need to lose 15 pounds. How do I do this with a six and an eight year old and Chloe's birthday this weekend where there'll be cake and we have to go to chocolate fondue because that's like her thing. 
She's six. I'm screwed. Um, <laughs> and then on Sunday brunch, how am I going to lose these 15 pounds? We're all really good at telling us where we need to go, but we're really bad at giving you any of the tools to get there. Phrases is the communications toolkit for the chief health strategist. So when you go to talk to education, when, here's a great one. Afford, we all think affordable housing is a good thing. Do we all generally agree on this? Uh, and inclusionary zoning is probably a good thing. There's a lot of pushback on inclusionary zoning from the developer community. I know you're shocked. Um, so when you go to meet with a housing person and they say, hey, I just read that inclusionary zoning is a bad thing for our city. What are your messages? What are your counterpoints? And I think sometimes because we're not trained in housing, and we don't know those messages, we kind of stumble around. We have to be on point. We have to be able to hit the messages hard. We need to be able to pivot and, and deliver the information that we want to allow us to build the partnership. Phrases will try to give us um, those messages. And so that's coming soon. Um, I will give a plug for the uh, two co-chairs because I think it's the coolest thing ever. Karen DeSalvo, who was the former Assistant Secretary of Health, is one of the co-chairs of Phrases, and Soledad O'Brien. Um, so if you remember her from NBC and HBO, if you like real sports, Brian Gumbel, um, Soledad rolls around there. Uh, she's a wicked cool person. And one of those people that I, I reached out to her on Twitter, uh, and I said, I'm not a stalker, and I'm not a murderer. I run a real foundation, and I want to sit and talk to you because you don't know you're doing public health. And we sat down, and she does public health. She's done stories on autism. She's done stories on PTSD. She is a public health practitioner, and she never knew it. And it's to our advantage for her to think that she's a public health practitioner. And so that's the kind of evolution that we're looking at with these kinds of, of, of projects. So equally important to the partnerships is the policies. This is really important for us. Oh, that slide's supposed to be black. Don't worry. It's OK. It's OK. Uh, in my doctoral program, so I do, because I, you know, I believe like you should listen to me and not just read my slides. And I did this in my, in my doctoral program, and, they, and he was going to fail me, because he said, your slides are ineffective. And I was like, well, there may be a problem between academia, academia and practice. But we can, that's another talk <laughs> for another day. Um, and so when you think about it, there's no test, there's no vaccine, there's no procedure that can really deal with the fact that I don't have any place to exercise in my community. I don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. I've been exposed to alcohol and tobacco marketing since I was a wee child and all through, you know, growing up. You know, healthcare can't fix the fact that um, what we know from the literature is if you pass alcohol outlets on the way to school, you're more likely to experiment with alcohol. Policy can fix that. Policy can fix that. And, and that's what we have to be much more thoughtful about. Look at some of these policy solutions. In a city of a million residents, a 40% expansion of transit developments has an annual health benefit of $216 million. After rehabbing housing, 62% of adults have excellent health compared to 33% before. Early childhood education is associated with a benefit cost ratio of $5 to $1. Each time the earned income tax credit increases by 10%, infant mortality drops by 23.3 deaths per 100,000. Policy, all policy, where your bus routes are, who can be in your schools, policy. That's an important piece here. That's an important piece in this, in this conversation. But for all the public health people who stood up, this is our challenge. So if you've never heard of the Public Health Workforce Interest and Needs Survey, PH wins, you need to. Public Health wins, PH wins, is the largest nationally representative survey of the public health workforce. We did it in Illinois. We have these data on the workforce, what their training needs are. It's then comparable to other states, comparable to the region. In 2014, we did this. We had 37 states and 10,000 responses. This survey just came out of the field in 2017, so we have two data points, 47 states, 98 localities, 47,000 responses. 
it is a, a, a font of data that you all need to tap if you care about workforce development. What 2014 told us is that really the big training needs were influencing policy and understanding the relationship between new policy and many types of public health problems. This slide just basically tells you as much as we all talk about health in all policies, only half of the workforce even knew what we were talking about. There is help though. And this is, again, two of the tools that I talked about at the beginning, tools that are important. Um, City Health, which is our project, nine policies that we rated in 40 cities, and we gave these cities gold medal, a gold medal, a bronze medal, or a silver medal, depending on where they had these policies. Fewer than half of the cities could actually get an overall medal. You needed to have a, a bronze, at least a bronze in four of those policies. And then you have high five. This is from CDC. Things like you know early childhood overlaps, but there are things like you know grants and loans to keep up housing, right? And I know we know the argument, right? The argument's going to be, oh, if you give people loans to keep up their house, then everyone's going to go to disarray. That's false, but we then kind of curl into a ball and go, I don't know what to say next. That's where that messaging comes in. So what's interesting about city health? is some of the partnerships that it's taken to move the policies. In Kansas City, Missouri, our most important partner was the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce is kicking ass. And I'll tell you what's interesting is we sat down with them and they said, hey, this paid sick leave thing, that's a third rail. We can't do it with you. It doesn't work with our membership. It's not gonna happen. Now then you have a choice, right? And sometimes we get too idealistic in public health and we're like, well, if you don't want to work on that, we're out. Thank you for, our, thank you for your time. But we said, okay, so what can you work on? I said, well, we can work on complete streets, and we can work on Tobacco 21, and we can work on paid sick leave. I'm sorry, we can work on uh, early childhood. And so they've already moved their medal in a year. We've had five cities move their overall medal. We've, we've had 15 uh, individual medals move because we're catalyzing this change. And the beauty of that City Health website is it shows every city kind of what you need for bronze and what you have, what you need for silver, and what you need for gold. And I know not everybody, I think Chicago is the only city from Illinois in that data set, but that information is applicable. I just didn't have enough money to do every city in the country. So I had to start with 40. But the information there is totally applicable and gives you a platform that you could use in your communities. In San Antonio, Texas, they just passed Tobacco 21 in the city. That was the health commissioner working with the Heart Association in partnership with the business community uh, and the Chamber of Commerce because you know, if you do Tobacco 21 in a city, that means in my shop, in the city of San Antonio, I cannot sell to anyone um, under the age of 21, but in your shop in Bear County, which could literally be as close as we are, you can. But they did it. They did it. And they did it through partnerships. And that's what's really important. Now, anytime I talk about policy, I always have to bring this up. That there are corporate interests whose profits are dependent on the population remaining fat, addicted, and afraid. This is the fun working at a foundation. I can say stuff like this. Um, but it's true, right? What if, what if Lucky Charms gave kids syphilis? How long would Lucky Charms be on the shelf? Like another, what, two minutes? What if playgrounds caused polio? There would be a national response, an immediate national response. We have the blood of dead children on our hands. We have an obesity epidemic that we've now just lost any interest in. Have you noticed that? Like opioids, I guess we, we solved the obesity crisis, and so we moved on. So obesity is still a crisis we just don't talk about anymore. Opioids is a crisis of today. It will be the crisis of tomorrow and there'll be a new crisis coming up. So how do we, we need to be, again, very thoughtful about partnerships because I'll tell you, uh, Pepsi doesn't really care that we're meeting. Coke doesn't care that we're meeting. Coke and Pepsi and McDonald's and everybody else is gonna care when the CEO of FedEx says, you know, I'm noticing that a lot of my drivers can't fit in the truck anymore. That's a problem. Yes, it is. I've noticed there are a lot of sick days 
in my community. I've noticed that sick days have jumped up a lot. I, I want Jeff Bessos to lead, and I want him to pick his next the site for his next headquarters based on the health of that population and the likelihood that that community can be healthy. And that's going to mean things like paid sick leave because, you know, Bessos wants to have public transportation and his folks have paid sick leave. But when you're on that, that you know, tube or metro or T or whatever you're on, and the guy next to you has flu because he couldn't take the day off, or the kid next to your kid in school has flu and they're just hopped up on Tylenol because mom couldn't take the day off from work. That's a problem. See, the problem with, with where we are and why we need partnerships and why we need to actually confront some of these challenges is someone has to lose, right? It's just how it is. We're a closed system. You know, people on, on one side can't get more without people on the other side getting less. The problem is that we've just kind of picked the poor to lose. We said that's okay. See, it's not okay, right? That's why... Um, Alexandria the other day just increased the tax on meals on restaurants to pay for their affordable housing trust fund. Good job, Alexandria. That's a public health that's a public health intervention and that's something we can do as public health leaders and that we must do in order to make sure that we're we're getting where we need to go with the health of our populations. And know that this is coming. Okay, know it. Just be ready for it. Have your messages. Because someone's going to say this. Oh, you're nanny stating us. See, someone's going to decide and try to shape your behavior. And if it's not government, it'll be industry. That's why McDonald's does, you know, Happy Meals with toys in it. It's not because they just really like toys. It's because they're trying to, to addict a consumer. That's why Joe Camel was there. So government, in our nanny role, said, hey... You really can't use Joe Camel anymore. It's a bad idea. So we are protecting our population from those who may take advantage of it. So is it really the nanny state? And I'll give, I'll give the libertarians a choice all day long. If you want to smoke, I'm totally cool with that. You should go smoke. If you really had a choice. The problem is you don't. The problem is from the second you're born, you're hit with you know, tobacco advertising in communities, you're hit with alcohol marketing. You're hit with ideas that, you know, I mean, subtle things. Subtle things like, you know, my favorite is that Leonardo DiCaprio smoked throughout the entire movie of Titanic for no particular reason. Because while you're being drowned on a boat, it's easy to get a cigarette and light it up. Right? It, those subtle things that we need to fight against, and we need partnerships with folks like the media. So what I want to leave you with is that your responsibility, what public health has to be doing going forward, what public health 3.0 is all about, is a very simple transition. The health of our communities will not be improved by scientists, but by people. The answers won't come from a clinic, they'll come from our own communities. And that we need to make a transition from a culture that prioritizes pills and procedures to one that totally unlocks the power of policies and partnerships. That is your challenge. Take it and lead this country into better health. Because where we're going now is we're getting further apart, both economically and in a health standpoint. We need to figure out how we bring the country back together and let everyone prosper from everyone else's better health. So if you remember nothing, remember to every time someone starts talking about health and it starts to devolve into that conversation of pills and procedures, you stop them and you refocus the conversation on policies and partnerships. Thank you all very much.